Uh, let's all rise and stand. Welcome to our morning service. Thank you for here, being here and welcome to Tui service. We're so glad that you are here to worship God together as we come and for this is corporate worship. For those of us who are joining online as well, we are so glad that you can join us. I want to invite the congregation to responsibly read Psalm 36 with me. I will read where it says presider and we as the whole congregation will read out loud where it says all. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind takes refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life, and in your light do we see light. For continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. There the evildoers lie fallen, and they are thrust down, unable to rise. This is his word for us. Amen. I will now invite Deacon Kyung Choi to representatively pray on behalf of our worship service. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the light of the world, guiding our steps in your path. Thank you for the gift of our, the church, a community of your children that you, you have gathered together to worship, serve, pray, and love. In our worship together, let us remember that we worship the God who created this world, the God who spoke through his prophet from generation to generation. Led his people from captivity to liberty, healed the sick, fed their hunger, and was faithful even when faced with rejection. The same God who wanted all people to be drawn to his love and grace, to know his forgiveness and the joy of his salvation. Let us put aside all our differences and join together in this worship and praise. We're especially thankful, thankful that youth and promised land are open to worship in person. Would you bless the promised land and keep them safe from the COVID? Lord, strengthen your church through the attendance of your people. May we be filled with the desire to support and encourage one another in love and serve to you. Would you also bless your church that help each other grow in our faith. Please protect our church, small group leader, from this difficult time, and we'll fill them with your loving heart. As they shepherd your people, strengthen their spirit and restore their soul through the work of your Holy Spirit. May they find rest in your loving care. Bless Pastor Moon and this worship team as they proclaim your word today. Please give them to strength and heavenly wisdom so we can have life-transforming experience from this worship. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us worship the Lord together. Every child 
Amen. I invite now the church to reflectively read with me the Westminster Catechisms to guide us in our confessions before the Lord. I will read the questions and the congregation will read the answers together out loud. What is the sum of the four commandments which contain our duty to God? The sum of our duty to God is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our strength and with all our mind. What is the sum of the six commandments which contain our duty to man? The sum of our duty to man is to love our neighbor as ourselves and to do to others what we ha have due to us. Let us now pray this corporate confession unto God together. O God of love, you love us perfectly, but we fail to love you and our neighbors well. We find ourselves more absorbed in self-serving than self-giving. Our love is often based upon our emotions rather than our commitments. We love out of convenience rather than selflessly like Christ did for us. Our love for you and our neighbors has been shaky, shallow, half-hearted, impatient, passive, and stagnant. Father, we once again turn to your steadfast love, which is higher, deeper, and greater than any other love in this world. For you sent your precious Son and gave us the spirit of adoption. We love you because you first loved us. So teach us not only to love in words and in speech, but also in deed and truth. Help us to love one another just as you love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray in confession and take this personal prayer of confessing to the Lord to repent specifically and tangibly in our personal repentance. Let us pray. Jesus, Lord, we thank you. God, I have failed, Lord, to love you, love others. God, we pray, God, that there is forgiveness. And Lord, may I see Christ. And Lord, may I see. May I turn to your steadfast love. May I first realize, experience the love that you have for me, that this can change this heart of mine. Help us, Lord Jesus. Together, we would hear the word together. And through that, Lord, that you would be in words and in speech and in deeds and in truth, to love you and to love others. Thank you, Lord, for this, Lord. We pray, Jesus, Lord, that you would help to come to you. To come to you. Brothers and sisters, let us hear the assurance of forgiveness and the promise of restoration that our God offers to us through the gospel from 1 John 4, 13 through 19. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love, we love because he first loved us, amen. Church, be encouraged, because despite our shortcomings and blindness, our God assures us with these truths. So let us lift up our hearts of a reassurance to the Lord's prayer that Christ Jesus taught us. Let us now pray together with one voice. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us continue to sing unto God in repentance and in assurance of his truth. Just one look 
at your cross This is where we see This is where we see how love works For you surrender your all This is how we know that you have loved us first This is where we chose love you in return for you so loved the world that you gave your only son love amazing so divine we will love you in return for this life that you give for this death that you have died love amazing so divine we will love you in reply Let's give glory to the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Church, we will now continue to worship God as we give our offerings to the Lord. As we've learned all five offerings, we give our offering to Him. And if you'd like to give an offering, you may visit casepc.org and click on online offering. And we navigate you so that you may give online. You can also give on uh, offering at the basket right out in the front doors. Let us now give the offering of our lives unto our God through prayer. Let's take a few moments to tangibly commit our upcoming week to serve our God. Let's take a moment to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we pray God, that we would be an offering just to love you, Jesus. God, it is hard for me to give because maybe I've forgotten my first love. Maybe I've forgotten who has loved me first, you. And so Lord, today may it be a reminder 
May it be the proclamation that God loved us through His Son Jesus Christ by giving up His Son, and in His life and resurrection, Lord, it is ours. So help us, Lord, to be awakened. Help us, God, to wake up from this slumber, that we would have a revival in our spirits and in our hearts to know that we are Yours. We thank You, Lord, and may we tangibly live our lives to You, to You. And to our neighbors, to love completely. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us rise again from our seats for our scripture reading for the reading of God's word. Our scripture reading today comes from Revelation chapter two, verses one through seven. This is God's word. Please give it your careful attention. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Who walks among the seven golden lampstands? I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have: you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who also has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to the, to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Uh, good morning. It's good to see you.、Uh, those of you who are、um, on their Labor Day trip, I wish you a safe journey, and that you would participate in corporate worship anywhere and somewhere.、Uh, we are embarking on a new series. It's called the Diagnosis of the Church.、Uh, we are diagnosing、uh, the state of our faith, the state of our minds, the state of our hearts. And、uh, I would easily say, we are embarking on the most scariest part of Revelation. Uh, it's not the fire. It's not the brimstone. It's not the、uh, the judgments that are calling. It's not the trumpets.、Uh, chapters two and three are objectively the scariest because it dissects and looks into and analyzes the heart of a Christian.、Uh, this is the、uh, John the Apostle's letters to seven churches, and so he's on Patmos Island. He's been exiled there. And he's writing to seven churches, and all these churches have different symptoms. They have different problems and different solutions.、Uh, but listen to this:、uh, the solution that we see for them and the problems that we see for them, they're all typologies of a church. So every church that we have fall into some of these categories, either simultaneously or one exclusively. And it's telling us also that every Christian. Is in one of these seven letters, and there is a combination of all these issues in the heart of a single believer. And so, this is not just a diagnosis of the church. Remember, remember ecclesiology. This whole year has all been about ecclesiology: who is and what is the church. We are the church. Therefore, anything that diagnoses the church, it also describes us. You get that? That's a major premise of why we embark on this quest, starting from today until seven weeks from now. Or trying to find out where we are and who we are. So, join me now in prayer. Let's pray. Father, I come to you exhausted, struggling and wrestling with this word, and even more exhausted at my inability to live it out. I come exhausted at my own sinfulness. Um, but Father, I come to you with hope. I come to you like a beggar that has heard good news of bread and water. And Father, I pray that this would be the hearts and minds of the congregation as the word is explained to them. May they form a thirst and a hunger that the world can never give them, and may they, in their desperation, reach out to Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that they would be saved、uh, to the uttermost. That their hearts would be restored, 
that they would discover their long-lost love for you, Father, that the mature Christians here would once again understand why they are to love you and why they are to serve you, Father, that we would recover our hearts. Holy Spirit, please make yourself known to us today. Reveal yourself and point the spotlight on Jesus Christ, that his work and his life would be known in us, Father. Please minister, administer to all the congregation members who need to hear today's message. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Apostle John, when he's writing this letter, is now 90 years old. Uh, he's the only disciple, the only apostle uh, of Jesus that didn't die a violent death. I mean, they tried to fry him in oil, and he somehow survived, and, and that's how uh, tradition goes, uh, church tradition. And he's exiled to Patmos here, uh, which is a uh, mining quarry, a small, a small island uh, of exile. Now, the book of Revelation consists of God giving John a series of revelations, uh, knowledge of the future, um, but we have to remember that this is an apocalyptic letter that comes from Jesus' own mouth to seven churches in Asia Minor. Let's look at the first picture that we have. So John is writing from the island over there in Patmos on the bottom left, uh, left-hand side. And he's writing to all these churches. And so you look at the churches, there, it starts with, um, today, Ephesus, and then Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, and then Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And what's interesting uh, is that currently, like in Turkey, in that area, that's the order of the post office drives as well. And so uh, uh, the Turkish post office actually takes, uh, uh, goes around and delivers mail in that order. And so John has a pretty good knowledge, a uh, good knowledge of Ephesus and the cities that surround Asia Minor. He's been there, and so he knows he's writing in an order that's specifically for these churches. And so seven letters to seven churches uh, contained within uh, two chapters of Revelation. That's what we're looking at. And what's most important here is that we have to understand the city, we have to understand the circumstances, we have to understand what's happening so that we apply it to us a lot more fruitfully. After John completes writing this, this letter, a messenger is likely sent out to, uh, carrying seven copies written by hand of this book of Revelation to each of these churches. And we have to remember that these are seven specific churches with their own context and their own issues. But uh, in the wisdom and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these letters are made typical and typological for every church that exists today. The Christian is called to see what the Lord says to each church and examine whether we suffer from these same issues and the same diseases. And trust me, we do. We really, really do. And in fact, each of these seven letters speak to us from different angles, all that are meant to aid the Christian in becoming holistically Christ-centered, a holistic church. And this is meant not just to diagnose us, but to cure and remedy us. I pray that KCPC would really examine each of the diagnoses and really bring to heart and mind the remedy that Jesus is bringing here. Now, Ephesus, let's focus on the text today. Ephesus was the center of pagan worship. It was uh, towards Artemis. Uh, Artemis, also called Diana, she, was, uh, she or he uh, was an, andro- uh, an androgynous goddess or god of wild animals, uh, bearing children, hunting and vegetation and fertility. And so she was an uh, androgynous god which encouraged its citizens to engage in uh, various forms of sexuality. It was where thousands of cult prostitutes and priestesses would gather, uh, priestesses celebrated Artemis by sex and festivals and drunkenness, and so many routes of trade came through here that also Ephesus was seen as an economic powerhouse. It connected so much trade back then. And because it was a harbor city, uh, there were rivers going into its, uh, its harbors, you see what we call a mixture of different cultures. We call this cultural syncretism, where cultures are mixed and matched regardless of how consistent it is. So cultures are just mixed and matched here. And so we see many cultures with, uh, mixed with one another in a general uh, identity of relativism and confusion, And so, listen, wealthy, religious impulses, moral impulses that are relativistic, 
decaying sexual morality and just an overall concept of relativism pervading the, the society. And now I'm getting confused uh, if this is Ephesus or the United States. And we see how much of this applies to us today. Ephesus was a really, really, really good church that survived in the midst of Ephesus. And a very, very good church will have the characteristics of Ephesus to survive in the United States right now. So let's look at what Jesus says you did well. Jesus commends this church for so many of his good works. And so let's look at verses 2 to 3 and then 6. Verse 2 to 3, I know your works, I know what you did, your toil and your patient endurance. You're so patient and you toiled. The word toil here is basically uh, struggling and producing until exhaustion. Basically burnout. So they're burning out for the sake of the gospel, serving people and loving people and, uh, and, and, and keeping the church. And it says, how you cannot bear with those who are evil. So not only were they wishy-washy, loving people, they also had correct doctrine, and they knew who to hate and who to to love. And that sounds so prohibitive in our culture because we are Ephesus. How dare we hate someone? But here we see a Lord that commends people for hating evildoers. There is evil, there is good in God's universe. And our culture doesn't understand that. It also says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. So they're also good with doctrine. They're also good with uh, discernment. They know who are false. They know who's true. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. Why are they patient? Why are they struggling through tribulation and suffering well? Because for the sake of the Lord. What a beautiful church. Beautiful church. And you have not grown weary. They have not burned out. They have continued serving the Lord consistently. Let's look at this short passage. Uh, One thing that just really came to mind, it's almost like me just doing QT in front of you right now. Jesus says, I know. Amen? Jesus knows. He knows what you did, why you serve why you took that blame, why you were gossiped about and yet you still persevered. He knows why you serve church. He knows how you're still persevering in your faith and you're fighting for the glory of God. He knows. And it does not go unnoticed. He knows your struggles. He knows your inner life. We fool each other. We don't know about each other. I don't know your stories and you don't know mine. And yet it says, with a great word of comfort for all of us, Jesus knows what we're going through right now. And also, he knows when you toil and endure patiently. The word toil, once again, refers to the working to the point of exhaustion. Everyone here in, in this church, they're seen as a collective singular. One, a, a large group of people, but seen as one body as a church. And Jesus is telling them, you are toiling. All these people are collectively engaged in total mission. All of them. And I envy this. And the standard United States church, about 10% of the congregation works and toils and plans and administrates and serves and uses money and serves the people. And about 90% on average, on average, stand on the sideline waiting to be fed, entertained, or cared for, and wondering why no one's reaching out to them. And The reality here is that everyone is engaged in total mission, toiling together for the glory of God. Like, I want to be in this church. Like, this is an awesome church. He also knows when you discern correctly what's true or not. I mean, they've uprooted false prophets. They haven't been confused. And it's no wonder. Ephesus, this area, what you need to know about this area is that it had the greatest teachers and pastors and apostles uh, sent to that area to care for it. They started out with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and then later on they have Apollo, uh, someone who is basically seen as Paul's rival in terms of ministerial experience and ministerial uh, um, uh, influence. And you also have the Apostle Paul taking care of this church. And the Ephesians loved Paul so much that they were actually crying and not wanting to let go of him when he had to leave. Also, you have Timothy, Paul's spiritual son, 
uh, taking care of this congregation. And uh, you, you have all the, uh, you have finally John the Apostle. John the Apostle is not just writing because he knows about this church theoretically. He was there. He taught the church in Ephesians. And so they had the dream team. They had everyone. It's like John Piper, Tim Keller, you know, all the influential pastors gathered into one and serving and toiling over one small church. And so no wonder they're able to discern They know what's going on. They know how to read the times. They know how to react. It's a very solid church. Verse 6, another commendation. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Uh, There's a lot of people who don't know uh, what the Nicolaitans are all about, and uh, scholars are still debating about what the exact nature of their teaching was, but they have come to some consensus is that they were antinomians, people who went against the law of God and only emphasized grace. Grace is everything, so I could do whatever I want. And they were known as a sex cult, and so they celebrated Christian freedom by having sex with anything and anyone. It's interesting how so many pagan worships of the day revolved around sexuality, and that's not—it's not just a modern issue. It's been there from the start. Like a lot of history is cyclical, even though there's development, a lot of things are just repeating over and over. And our generation is not novel; it's not new. Like what we see here is a repetition. So these people were disciplined people who had discernment, and they were swimming upstream against the Ephesian culture. I want you to understand this. Whenever Jesus says, you know, you hate these people, and so do I, like, that's not the Jesus we seem to know, right? Here's the thing. God is love. Jesus is love. And he is so good that that should terrify us. Like, good and love applied to a broken world, applied to a sinful world, equals justice, and correct hatred. You get that? So if I love my children, I will hate the speeding alcoholic driver that kills them if they got into a car accident. Because that's love applied to a broken world. If you love the Lord fiercely, you will hate the things that go against the, the Lord in terms of worldview or philosophy or actual practice. You will have that consistency. Love applied to a broken world equals correct hatred. So we have to understand that about the love of the Lord. And this will be applied later on. Also, he says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. They suffer well. They have a good theology of suffering. That's a lot of mature Christians there. And they haven't tired of it. For what? Because, not because of pride or false humility or keeping up a facade, but for Jesus' name's sake, to glorify God, they are preser- persevering. What a beautiful church that we need right now. I say that this church has the five D's, the five D's. Deeds, discipline, discernment, doctrine, and determination. This is a wonderful church. Like, we would send our children to this this kind of church in a heartbeat. Where America is beginning to look more and more like Ephesus. The church should have these aspects that Ephesus has the church in Ephesus has, towards the surrounding neighbors. So, if this is such an awesome church, you know, founded by the best people, taught by the best people, actually doing good works, persevering in their culture, what's wrong with them? And the question question can be flipped. A lot of you are spectacular Christians. DT, you memorize Bible verses, you evangelize, You're so sharp in your thinking. You know how to glorify God. Can there be anything wrong with you? Let's diagnose ourselves. Here it is. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Here's the heck out of me. I think I operate and do ministry 5% of the time out of my first love. 95% of the time, training, discipline. It's my calling. It's my resolve. It's my grit. It's my determination. I will serve the Lord. I want to ask us, like this was a question I asked a long time ago, how much of our church would still operate without the Holy Spirit? 
how much of our church and its programs would still operate without the love of God beating in their hearts, I would say 95%. Because we're so well-trained, so systematized. And Jesus says, I have this against you. You lost your love. How many of you here believe in Christ? Raise your hand mentally. Okay, if you've believed in Christ and you consider yourself mature, raise your hand mentally. Now, if you're mature and your hand is still up mentally, how much of you have lost your first love? Probably all of us. What's happening? You would think that in this country of relativism and in this country of just rampant, you know, just paganism everywhere, that doctrinal mistakes would be Jesus' criticism. Like, you're compromising. You're not knowing the times well. You don't know how to interact with Ephesians, like the people there. But they have so guarded carefully against doctrinal deviance that another side effect happened, dying love. A lot of Reformed churches, a lot of PCA churches, we are so correct in our thinking, and we know when to split apart people because their thinking and their worldview is wrong, and yet, how cold have you become? Not speaking for them, I'm speaking for myself. What used to be fervent and bright love for Christ turned into just an act of Going through the motions, like coming to church, standing up and sitting down, standing up and sitting down, going to Bible studies, good works. Relationship cooled into religion. This might sound too strict, and so I want to make this actually sound a lot more relatable. Um, Let's say there's a couple, and uh, before marriage, they loved each other. Like, they spend 18 hours talking over the phone. If that's you, I'm not talking about you. I'm just making up a scenario. <laughs> they spend 18 hours talking on the phone. I love you. Like, what's, what's your favorite food? Why do you believe in Christ like this? You know, why do you go to this church? And the conversation is just so infatuating because you're so in love with each other. And the smallest thing about each other puts your heart on fire. And then one day, they get married. And let's say the man, he comes to the pastor, me in this case, let's say, And he asked me, Pastor, um, it's our anniversary. It's our 10th anniversary this year. Do I have to buy a flower? Listen to that language. Do I have to? Do I have to come to church? Do I have to offer one-tenth of what I have? Do I have to serve? Like, do I have to not drink alcohol? Like, it's all legal obligation. Where's the relationship? Like, what would you warn that sister if you were the pastor and you're praying for that sister? What would you pray about? Lord, rekindle their love. Like, let them talk for 18 hours over the phone because they love each other and not ask, what do I have to do for this person? And that's exactly what's happening here. They have to do this. They have to keep the doctrine. They have to be vigilant in their fight against the world. And yet, it's obligations and not out of love. Like the saddest story ever. Any relationship, you would casually advise your friend, get out of that relationship, or if you're Christian, stay in that relationship and rekindle the fire of love and commitment. Can you repeat after me? Jesus doesn't want me to be a perfectly behaved android. Jesus doesn't want to see clean, cookie-cutter Christians who wear a tie, who give offerings, and who serve people, and their hearts are stone. Jesus wants to see something else. He wants to see the recovery of a lost love. And so many of us are so well-cultured, so slick, so disciplined, and we call them, in Jesus' language, whitewashed tombs, rotting in the inside, and yet trying to keep up a facade of life and fertility, looking clean on the outside. What Jesus is really saying is, this is really scary. If both propositions are true, proposition number one, you have deeds, discipline, discernment, doctrine, and determination. And on the other hand, 
This is, proposition two is also true at the same time that you have lost your first love. Okay, well, how, how do you make sense of that? That you're awesome in your actions and your heart is lost. What does that mean? In other words, if you are doing tons of stuff, but your heart isn't there, this only means one thing. You are doing the same things with a different love. We are made to worship. We are made to love. We are made to be in love with something. I mean, our lives cannot be consistently sustained without a consistent love for something. You, we are always worshiping something. Usually it's where you spend most of your time. It's Netflix or YouTube or TikTok. We always need to be worshiping something. And here's the thing. If you have another affection and you're doing old things and the two don't mix... That's the danger that Jesus is pointing out here. Like, is there consistency in your life? This is called uh, legalism. Doing the right things, uh, but with the wrong heart. Uh, this is also called idolatry. You're worshiping something with the wrong heart and keeping the facade up. Or let me just read this another way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. That's a biblical way to put it. When you lose your love for God, this is what happens. Number one, you try to keep up what you have been doing because you know it's right. And this leads to ritualism, repeating the ritual. And at the first stage, at this first stage, Christians proceed with a sense of cognitive dissonance. They're like, okay, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to continue being Christian, but my heart is more and more chasing after, after the world. I mean, that's all of our youth kids. They, their parents are suppressing upon them a Christian culture, but their hearts are running away at the same time, and they can't show it. And when they get to college and they have freedom, that's when their hearts and their actions are aligned, and they leave the church in consistency in a new direction. Do you get that? Sorry to talk about this here, uh, but I want to make you uncomfortable. Uh, JG and All Stars have been gathering in worship and uh, there were a few All-Stars parents complaining. You know, like, um, I don't like this worship service because my innocent, pure children are looking at older brothers and sisters who have, you know, torn jeans and who are, you know, like, not really worshiping and they have a bad lifestyle. And so I don't want my children to be exposed to that. And my immediate response was, I need to start a uh, juvenile penitentiary, like a prison ministry, and then try to bring them here. Because God doesn't want well-behaved, slick children. He wants people responding to the first love that God gave them. And prisoners who know that they are sinners have a better chance of responding to God with authentic love than people who have been fooled by their parents that you're good, you're holy, you keep clean, you do what you need to do, you play the violin and you play the instruments, you look the best you can on Sundays, and their heart is gone. I want wretched people shouting up and down, jumping up and down because of their love for God, which they could never expect, and their actions would show later. And I want to turn this into a science experiment. Our kids in their youth group versus penitentiary prison kids who have experienced the gospel, which one produces better fruit 10 years from now? I want that to be a survey. This is exactly what's happening here. They say that the lack of love towards your spouse is often a symptom of another addiction or an affair. Something else is filling the empty space because humans always have to be filled with some kind of love. It starts with innocent entertainment. You love your spouse, but Netflix is just cool, and your mind wanders, and there's silence and emptiness, and you fill that with other things. You love your wife, but your hobby calls out to you, and at that time you spend doing your hobby is the time lost with your life, with your wife, and therefore bit by bit by bit, it grows into a rift that can only be satisfied by, get this, a new relationship. 
Affairs start from innocent silence. The same holds for your love with Jesus. We think that not being theologically educated is the biggest issue in our church right now. We think that people not knowing apologetics is the biggest issue right now. Let's look at the next picture. Um, Some people think that modernism caused this descent down into atheism. So uh, Christianity, Bible is not infallible, man not made in God's image, no miracles, no virgin death, no deity, no atonement, no resurrection, agnosticism, and then atheism. How do you get down those steps? The first step is this. You you lose your love. You lose your love, and then everything else is triggered, and you see all the other churches that come after today's sermon are all reflecting this in a different way. It always starts with this. Silence that leads to another affection, kicking out your affection for God and replacing it, and then you fall. You get that? Affections are not replaced by emptiness, Affections are replaced by another affection. Try answering this question. I love Jesus and blink. Is there anything else that you love besides Jesus? Well, in the days that you find it hard to be loved by Jesus, that hard to love Jesus, that blink will be your, pri- that your primary focus. And that's where the slipping happens. This is legalism. This is Phariseeism. Actions without the right heart. Keeping up the facade where your mind is filled with another affection. Trying to gain merit instead of operating out of merit. Let me tell you, hell will be filled with decent, well-mannered people who don't curse, who don't spit, who know their theology. These are people that you gladly marry your children to because they live such well-mannered lives out of their own strength and not out of a response to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't put a finger on it, but it's probably one of these reasons that was causing Ephesus to toil so hard. Something that they're trying, like, they're like maybe they're thinking, we need to keep this up, we need to fight this fight. Like, pride might have been it, it might have been a, a, a reputation issue with the people around them, like, we got to keep this up. Do you know that a lot of churches operate out of not just love, but also hatefulness? And when the love for God is gone, sometimes the only thing that remains is the hatefulness. Do you, do you get that? Like Westboro Baptist Church, they o- their only selling point is to hate gays. And some churches, their only selling point is to love gays. I mean, where's Christ? Because they lost him, and they're trying to find other affections to focus their life upon. Hatred can fuel a church for a long time. And people don't know that they're falling down this slip, this slippery slope. In this letter, you know, all these letters are written to what they call the messenger of the church. And it's sometimes translated as angels. But I also think that pastors are in mind. This letter is written to pastors. And so this is a rebuke towards me. Like, congregation, please remind me. If you ever see me toil and labor and defend the church and be passionate up here because of a hobby horse and not because of Jesus, you must rebuke me saying, Pastor, if you aren't doing this out of Jesus' love for you, then please rest or this church will die. You need to tell me that. Like our church cannot be driven by any other agenda apart from loving and being loved by Christ. Amen? Amen. That's how a church survives for a long time, by focusing on the love of Christ. Our hearts must be filled. You are toiling for something. You are working so hard Monday through Friday even. Not just church life. Your daily life is filled with an affection towards something. What is that affection? Is it Christ? Is it the love that you receive from him that causes you to serve so diligently in the societies? Or is it the paycheck? Is it the concept of survival? Is it your reputation that you're striving so hard for? What happens? This is not just a silly, you know, issue that we can just brush off. What happens if your heart and your actions do not match and you're, you, lo- you lose your love? Let's look in this next picture. Jesus says, I will remove your lampstands. 
The lampstand stood for the church. In other words, Jesus is saying, if I remove the lampstand, I am removing your identity as a church. If you look at Ephesus, if you look at modern-day Turkey, there's a lot of beautiful buildings like this. I don't think this is actually a Turkey, but there's a lot of beautiful buildings like this that don't function as churches anymore. Disco clubs, bars, uh, mosques, they're all being uh, renovated. They're renovating church spaces. Why? Because the church had its lampstand removed because Christ was not the center. Because the love of Jesus was not the center of all that they were. They dived into other like, hobbies to do. Like, if you're here because you want to you know, impress upon the church Republican ideas, or if you're here because you're all for social justice and you're not seeing this, you're ignoring history. You're ignoring what Jesus does with churches that don't have Christ in the center. This is what happens to every church that loses his love. And if KCPC does not keep his eyes focused on loving Christ, this will happen to us in a short time. The world is getting a lot more Ephesian-esque. We're becoming a lot more relativistic and paganistic and sensualistic. The church, the only way it can survive is not to focus on how to combat the world, how to interact with it, but how to love Christ and be faithful to him. So, what do we do? How do we recover lost love? Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So, for all of us here who look nice and clean and well mannered and organized on the outside, once again, talking about myself, who have an appearance of doing the five D's but have lost our love who have the appearance of holiness but have lost its power, what do we do? Remember, repent, and redo. How did you love God first? Does anyone remember? Mine was, my experience was back in middle school. Um, how did I love God? How did I fall in love with him? Uh, I was empty. I was cold. I was regretting that I went to the retreat because I was chasing after a girl and she wasn't even talking with me. So I was just at the retreat, not doing anything. Boom. God loved me. He said that he died for me. He forgave all my sins. And a second-year middle school student who had no concept of all these things suddenly understood God took the initiative. He loved me. He saved me when I couldn't. And then... Uh, I, I wrote down in my journal, I felt like I was walking on clouds because I was so lifted up by the love of God and I had nothing to do with it. And then, I just keep on remembering, like, what kind of love did God show me? He approached me first when I couldn't. Like, do you know that? When you were dead in your sins, God approached you when you had nothing to offer but the sin that you had that caused him to be crucified. Amen. Like God approached you first when you were dead. And then God approached me every single day so patiently. I mean, I had no time for him in uh, like high school and college. And here's the thing that broke my heart. Like, I was like, okay, okay, I'm so busy this week. Okay, I'm going to do 10 minutes of QT because I know I need to do it. And so do I have to? Yeah, okay, let's do it. I open scripture, boom, God's meeting me as if he was a beggar waiting for me, waiting for my attention. Like he's the king of kings and the lord of lords, and he was waiting for me. He was waiting for me. Like this God would wait for me. And you have that component of love, then you know how to wait for other people who have no idea how to love Jesus. You see, God's merciful forgiveness. You see, God, how he so loved you that he held on to you. Like when I was, you know, playing games or watching movies that I shouldn't have been watching, I felt God's arms wrapped around in the back of my chair, hugging me and crying for me and pronouncing judgment upon the things that I was doing because it was not of him. 
if I understand that love, I have now a love towards God that is constantly brewing and a hatred towards things that are not of him. And slowly, I am forming the things that the Ephesians are doing, the good things that they're doing, I'm forming out of what? Not because I'm trying to, because I see what the love of God is for me, I remember that love, and I'm responding. Love is a response. Amen? Let me, show, let me just give you an example. Um, Ilya and Ethan, four years and a half old and two years and a half old, uh, sister and brother, perfect formula for a fight. They fight every day. They fight and fight and fight, and then I tell them, can you make up and like, um, be nice to each other and tell them that you love each other? And I thought they would hug and say, I'm sorry. I thought they would hug and say, I, I, uh, I love you. But here's what they did. They held hands and they started dancing. <laughs> I was like, what the heck? <laughs> Where did that come from? And here's the thing. I remember when they got into trouble, um, uh, I would turn on Studio uh, Ghibli, and uh, there would be a house moving castle. That music sounds like a waltz, right? Da, 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 da. And I would play that and I'd hold my children and I would dance with them. I'd say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'd just dance with them. And so for them, love is not a vague concept. Love is turning on that music and dancing. So love is imitation of what you have received from God. Like that's what they saw their mom and dad do. That's what they saw me do to do for them. And that's how they love each other. And here's the thing. Where is your love coming from? It's an imitation. And if you have not seen the perfect love of God that can't be contained on the scrolls of the heavens and can't be written about by all the ink of the ocean that just as we sung, if you haven't seen that love, your love will always be finite limited, conditional, burning out, not enough. So why does Jesus say, remember? You have to see how God loved you. If you're serving at church, and if you're mature, the best advice I can give to you, read scripture, read scripture, remember how God loved you, remember how he loved you, remember how the salvation first came, remember how the gospel approached you in your sinfulness, and then you will have an ongoing power forever. A lot of pe people think of sanctification and Christian growth as, okay, here's the cross, I started from here, I'm going to walk away and continue into maturity. No, that's why Jesus says Christianity is you carrying the cross and remembering the cross every single day to have an understanding of how to live that day. You must remember the love of the cross to love that day. Expose yourself to the love of God. And then repent. Repent means to turn away from the strange fires that keep you kindled and working so hard that isn't the love of God in church, and outside. Evaluate your intentions right now. Like repentance requires a holistic evaluation of your life. What is fueling your work right now? What is fueling your daily interactions? Like Why are you trying so hard? I ask youth kids, and they never are able to answer this question. And it scares me. I ask them, why do you get up out of bed? And they say, you know, you know what? They say, because I have to. Most common answer, probably 80% of the time. Other 20% is because my parents tell me to. Evaluate why you get up out of bed every day. And if it's not the love of Christ, your function as a lampstand of Jesus will be removed because that's not the gospel. That's humanism, that's legalism, that's you trying extra hard, that is any other religion. You don't need Christianity then. The uh, last verse in today's text says, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. What's really interesting is that in Ephesus, if you, were, if you heard this phrase, of the tree of life, you often thought of uh, Artemis worship. So Artemis worship, uh, there was a temple for it, but the legend goes that the temple was built around a tree. Uh, Artemis had a tree of life, and if you ate of his fruit, you were saved, or you, you had access to Artemis. And so the temple of Artemis was built around that, that fabled tree. And so uh, John is speaking to the people in Ephesus. You know, there's a real tree of life. There's a real tree of life that you can eat from for, forever and every single day, and that is the love of God. 
And if you uh, are victorious every single day by eating of him every day, by participating in his life every day, and remembering the gospel, then you'll be in paradise. Uh, Easily spoken, every single day that you recall the love of God for you and what he did for you to save you out of your sheer misery and turn you into children of God, every single day that you do that can be heaven, paradise, and you overcome and then you will do what you must do. St. Augustine said this, love God, and then do anything you want. Because the heart will fuel any action necessary to interact with the community that we are in. But love God first. How? Let's see how good your memory is. Remember. Remember the gospel. Repent. Throw away all other fuels and sources of energy in your life apart from Scripture, apart from God's Word, apart from the Gospel, and redo. Do what you have been doing because the actions were not the problem, the heart was. This is the good news. For those of you who have lost your love, God loves you today. God loves you forevermore. Why does he talk about the Garden of Eden? Why does he talk about paradise? Because that's the place where it all started. That's the place where humanity and God first expressed their true love for one another. That's where God and Adam walked daily in their love for one another. And God's mind is fixated remembering that place where he had this love for his child. Like Just like my children remember my love for them through that song and that dance. Oftentimes, my dad would talk with me, and, you know, my parents are uh, missionaries, and they go back and from, from, forth from China and, and uh, uh, Canada right now. But before, we used to live in a student apartment called Brackenridge, a very, uh, you know, nice neighborhood, but very small, you know, small living spaces. That's the life of a Korean student, immigrant student. And my dad always talked about that place. I don't know why. He kept on talking about Brackenridge, Brackenridge, Brackenridge. Like, I'm age 25, like Brackenridge used to be so good. I was like, why, why? And then I noticed he had a picture of us in Brackenridge, or he was just holding on to me, a child, and I was just smiling this huge, foolish grin. And then it clicked, it clicked. Like, that's where my dad and I had the most intimate conversations of our life. And it was fun, uh, we loved each other, and that was where my, my, my dad's mind was fixed when it comes to thinking of love between us. God's saying this, come back to the Garden of Eden. I loved you. I still love you. I will continue loving you. The blood of Christ that is offered for you today is based upon the ancient love that God had in the Garden of Eden, and it will continue forever. And so the good news for any of you who are looking for where to find your love, God loved you first. 1 John 4, 19, this is love. Not that we loved God, You don't have that kind of love. This is love that God loved us first. Then our light will shine. Praise team, if you come up, let's pray. Father, I really hope that today's message was a rebuke and a comfort For those of us who have been Christian for a long, long, long time, and we have Bibles that are marked up with so many different colors of highlighters, and we know when to get at church, what time, and what time to serve. We know uh, what ministry I want to be involved in, and we're just so good at carrying out the rituals of our life. And Father, I pray that this sermon would be for them something that flushes out their dead hearts, their lost love. And it must be replaced, Father, by your love for them. Father, you promised through the new covenant that you would give us hearts made out of flesh, a heart that is capable of loving because it has been loved by you first. Father, the greatest blessing that you can pour out upon us right now 
is to approach each and every single person in this congregation, touch their heart and tell them, this is how I loved you. This is how I loved you. And you show them the cross. You show them every incident of their life where they were running away from you and you chased after them, the God of heaven, the, the king of all kings, chasing after bugs like us, bugs like me. And we see how great that love is. Father, if we need to learn how to love other people, other weird people that we can't vibe with, other strange people that we disagree with, politically, uh, just like political enemies that we see across the spectrum, if we need to know different ways to love them, help us find out the different ways that you loved us, Father. And then when we have recovered that love, and we have purged our heart of other affections and other competing desires, Lord, may our church never have its lampstand removed. May KCPC continue being a beautiful church that continues to serve you until you come, Father. May every family here never have their lampstands removed because their hearts are being rekindled by daily worship and by daily gospel proclamation and by daily recounting and remembering the cross of Jesus Christ for my life. May we never grow sick and tired of your love represented on the cross. And may that be our effectiveness in America and this rapidly crazy world that we would know how to be salt and light in this world. Please comfort anyone who has lost their love. Tell them there's more where it came from. There's more, an infinite supply of where this love came from. Come to me, child. Receive my love. Let me love you. Focus on me. Let me love you for a while. Would you tell them that, Father? So that they would never burn out. Thank you, Father, for having an infinite love for us. And that's how we're able to say, I love you, Lord. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us rise from our seats.
the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. We have been diagnosed. Your reality has been shown to you. You have been dissected before the word of God and your lovelessness or your pride has been exposed before God right now. What shall you do? What shall we do when God approaches you personally, not through a pastor, not through an angel, or not through a Bible verse, but he approaches you as the king of kings and he asks you, where is that first love? Our only answer can be this that suffices on that day. It is the Lord that is the love that you gave to me, Father, when you first saved me. That is what I present to you right now. It is that love that I present to you right now, the love that you showed to me and poured upon me through the cross of Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for loving me. I will love you forever. I will love you forever and ever. Until the stars fade, until the earth fades away, I will love you because the love that you showed me was forever. May that silence the hearts of those who are scared at their guilt of not having the right actions to prove before God because once we are loved, once we know that love, our actions will change. And may that silence the hearts of those who are proud about how Christian they are and when they're training their children just to look like them and not to feel and act according to what Jesus has shown them. May that show that they, their only chance of loving you how we should is through the love that you have given us. So Father, all your people proclaim, <laughs> stupidly ignoring our past week of lovelessness towards you. We proclaim in faith that we love you because you have first loved us in Christ and we are in Christ. So Father, receive our love and may our love never falter. Receive your benediction. May the love of God the Father that lasts forevermore and may Jesus Christ who manifests in his flesh and his death and the ministry of his life and the tender beckoning of the Holy Spirit who switches the question, must I do this? Do I have to do this too? Lord, let me do this because you did this first for me. May this triune love be upon you and your children and your families and KCPC that our lampstand would not be removed but be functioning and operational before you until you come, that you would call KCPC good and faithful church and all of our families would be called good and faithful lampstands, church of the living Christ. Now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Please be seated. Can we give glory to God? Uh, today we're starting something special. Uh, for two months in a row, I talked about this quite a while, uh, we will have soon leaders or represent, representatives of their soon to come and do a testimony about what God is doing in their lives in the soon. And so can we welcome, uh, can we welcome Paul, Deacon Paul, uh, and really support him in his ministry? Hello, my name is Paul, a husband to Esther or Onyang, as some may know, father to Elise, Estelle, Elizabeth, and Emanuela, or Emma for short. Uh, we've been attending KCPC since 2016 and humbly host and lead the TBH soon. TBH has two meanings for us, uh, the beach haven soon, where we meet, and to be honest, something we believe is essential. We want our soon to be a place of honesty. So in the name of, and the theme of honesty, as a soon member, It has been hard to create new relationships and to say, see you later to others. It has been hard to be honest with people, knowing you may be attracting criticism, uh, your words could be used against you, or that honesty invested won't be reciprocated. Despite all this, soon has been the best part of our lives here at KCPC. Yes, the biblical training and programs at our church are great, but without a place to practice what you learn, without a place to show and receive love, it all means nothing. For that alone, I love our past and current Soon family. Our group is diverse in location, age, gender, life stage, ethnicity, and personalities. But the love we share is encouraging and life-changing. Our diversity is a slice of heaven, and when we worship together, it is good. When we see growth in one another, it is good. When neighbors see and comment on the love and support we have for each other, it is good. An example would be, 
When we were pregnant with Emma at 10 weeks, we were told she had trisomy 21, also known as Down syndrome. Uh, the news was crushing, but our soon struggled together with us. When God revealed Emma would be three months premature with additional health complications at one pound 15 ounces and was fighting for her life in the neonatal intensive care unit for three and a half months, our soon and church family supported us through food, finances, time, and most importantly, prayer. All this our neighbors saw and commented on. To be honest, when we could have isolated ourselves out of shame for something we had no control over, our soon family and the greater KCPC family brought us comfort, peace, and encouragement. When we heard discouraging words from different community circles, our soon was there and, and where we could be honest about our feelings, struggles, thoughts, and be encouraged through scripture and prayer. I know some of you may be thinking that soon isn't what you want. And I would say you're right. It's not something you want, but it's something you need. I pray you join us soon and grow as a body of Christ. Thank you to all the current and previous soon members and glory be to God. Thank you. A couple of announcements for us before we close today's worship service. And Pastor John has a quick announcement for us. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for just giving me the couple of minutes here. Uh, today is our last day that we have uh, uh, English 2-7 discipleship training. And so what that is, is this. There's three marks of the church. One is gospel proclamation, which uh, we have seen and witnessed. Uh, and have, I hope, I pray you've been blessed by Pastor David Moon. Uh, the second one is the sacraments, uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism. Uh, but the last one is church discipline, church discipline. I, I know in our modern years that sounds really, really hard to hear. But to kind of understand what church discipline is, it's simply discipleship, discipleship. And so these are the three marks of the church. And if you are uh, now at a place in your life where you want a focused discipleship so that you can become more and more like Christ uh, with other people, believers, with other uh, uh, trained uh, members of our, uh, of our church body, uh, please go to kcpc.org uh, by today and register online uh, in, in that way. I know it might be a little bit hard to find, and so if you have any questions, please email me at john.huang at kcpc.org. Again, this is our 2-7, and that comes from Colossians 2.7. People ask me, what is 2.7? Uh, it's from Colossians 2.7 where it teaches us that we are to be rooted up in Christ. And so thank you so much, and hopefully I'll get to see you guys there. More announcements. Uh, the apologetics course will start in September. Please sign up. Uh, there's a great opportunity to learn how to apply the Word of God and have a biblical Christian worldview. Third, uh, a really very important announcement, there is a very exciting ministry that is starting, or more, not ministry, but more of a focus, and it is, a, it is the young adults uh, focus of our church. I just have a quick thing to share with us. Uh, after an extended season apart, we know everyone, especially young, young adults here, looking for a space and meet, a place to meet and reconnect with people in our congregation and build community. And so there will be a couple of brothers and sisters who have been planning and hosting a month of casual young adult fellowship nights called the September Social Series starting Wednesday, September 15th. By young adults, we particularly think of people from post-grad to those in early stages of marriage, although all of us are young at heart. The first night will be in the upstairs room of Ide Baker bakery reserved just for us please use a qr code to sign up from 7 to 9 p.m where we can enjoy drinks bread and food to get to know each other a little bit more our goal is to designate intentional space and time to really connect with our fellow brothers and sisters we especially encourage those of us who've joined our church between covid and now to come and get plugged in please sign in with the qr code so we can get a head count there is a flu shot available for those who are interested. Please look at the uh, uh, announcements. And then for our, our sojourn ministry, we have community groups uh, for fall that are continuing this week. We highly encourage all the college students in the area, especially those who attend GMU and Nova, to sign up through the Google form through the QR code. If you can't find for that for whatever reasons, please reach out to Pastor John Yoon to get connected. We also plan to use, second, we also plan to use Fridays as a way to spend more larger 
uh, group activities, so be on the lookout for the announcements. And also, if you want to listen and re-listen to our sermons, they are all available on Spotify and podcasts. And we also have a pastoral uh, uh, podcast where you can listen to some of the discussions that we can't discuss here on the pulpit. And finally, last, uh, we, uh, our, for our newcomers, our newcomers are wearing a name tag. If you see a name tag, please, as a member of our church and a member of Christ, let's invite them into our church and be warm in our invitation and love upon them. Let's give glory to the Lord and have a great week, everybody.